If you wanna build better systems, I think it's really important that you understand the many aspects of coupling. And that's what I'm gonna cover because it goes beyond just thinking about, for example, the dependencies on things, where A depends on B, B depends on D, C depends on A. This could be a monolith in process. It could be services or microservices. That's besides the point, but typically we're just thinking about these dependencies, but it goes much deeper than this. Hey, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. For example, this is how I think people typically think of microservices. So we have one service, which is a client. There's another service that's exposing some HTTP API. We're making that HTTP call. We're exchanging JSON, and this is what we're doing. But people seem to think that this is magically removing coupling. It did in some ways, but there's other aspects to coupling. Before I get to those, I'd like to thank Event Store for sponsoring this video. Event Store DB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, check out the link in the description. So we still have coupling here. I'm gonna take Gregor Hope's definition, which is coupling describes the independent variability of connected systems, i.e. whether a change in system A has an effect on system B. If it does, A and B are coupled. Introducing that HTTP call between two different services remove the technology coupling. If you were in a monolith and you were saying using .NET or you're on the JVM and you had a monolith, everything is running under the same bytecode, you're just talking in process. Because we've introduced that network call, we could have one system in .NET, another system in Ruby, Python, JVM, etc. We've removed that technology coupling. But as I mentioned, there's many aspects of coupling. Those HTTP APIs do not address the temporal aspect. That's where things like queues, message brokers, event-driven architecture, that's what they're focused on. But just because using a queue removes the temporal aspect, that doesn't remove all coupling. It's just that aspect. So we have service A placing a message on the queue and ultimately service B, which may be available and may process a message later. That's a temporal aspect. So it processed that message. A and B don't need to be available at the exact same time. But this didn't magically remove coupling either. We still have that dependency from A to B. A is placing that message on the queue, knowing that B is gonna process it at some point. Many people will say that event-driven architecture and the publish subscribe pattern is loose coupling because the producer, when it publishes a topic, it has no idea about the consumers. There could be zero consumers, there could be many consumers, and they're all handling that message independently. The producer and consumers are completely decoupled from each other. That's great, that has a lot of benefits, but you're not completely decoupled. And that's because if we go back to Gregor's definition, if you change something in system A and affect system B, then you're coupled. And what could do that? For example, let's say we just stop publishing the event. Well, if we have other consumers, other services that are expecting it as a part of workflow, well, we're probably broken now because we depend on it, we're coupled to it. What happens if we change the format or the data structure of that message of those events? Our consumers are expecting that. They have a contract saying, okay, this is the structure of the data, this is what I'm expecting. What if you change the location of the queue or the topic? Your consumers need to be aware of that, you're coupled. So there's many different aspects of coupling you need to be thinking about. We mentioned temporal. If you're making HTTP requests to some HTTP API, it's a synchronous request response. There's that temporal aspect. If you're using something like a message queue, message broker, and topics, publish, subscribe, you're removing that and you're being asynchronous. So that's more of loose coupling on that side. Same thing for location. If you're making an HTTP request, you need to know the URI, the host name, the IP, whatever technology you're using to make that direct communication you need to know what it is, or if it's to a broker or to a queue. Loose coupling on that hand is maybe you're using some type of registry, which you still have that aspect, but maybe what you're connecting to, you're oblivious to. I'm gonna have a post, or I'm gonna have a link at the end of this video about hypermedia, which if you've ever struggled to understand hypermedia, this may topic that I've just explained right now might give some insights to other videos because hypermedia is removing its loose coupling so that your responses are telling the client the actions and things that they can do and what those locations are, as well as the next part, which you can help with, is data, not just the format, but the structure. If you have a specific format that, that you're using, Jason, that's what people are expecting. That's what you're using. A looser form of that, if you're using HP and have an API, is doing some type of content negotiation, saying letting the client dictate what they want. They're still gonna need to know the structure of that, but the format they could be dictating. 
I mentioned tech. If you're in a monolith and you're using .NET, JVM, et cetera, all that in-process communication, that's you're basically tied there. You're coupled with that technology. But if you have different services, whether it be internal to you, some external service, it doesn't matter what technology is being used on one side or the other, you're loose coupled in that way. So when you hear tight versus loose coupling, in what aspect? So here's an example of what I think is an awesome example that illustrates all the various aspects of coupling. I was using Firebase's uh, cloud messaging APIs, the legacy ones, and you need to migrate to their HP V1 because they, they have this deadline. So this is used for doing things like push notifications. So doing this migration, I was using a NuGet package and how it dealt with sending this message authentication was now completely different. I had to use a completely different library. So I was technology coupled to that NuGet package. Instead, what I decided to do was just use HTTP client directly and send the HTTP request. I had to deal with authentication, which I mentioned is completely different now. So in doing so, the request that I'm actually sending for the push notification, that structure changed. So there was that data structure format change that I was coupled to before as well. The actual URI of the host name, that structure, that path that you had to send to from legacy to the V1, it also changed. So I was coupled in that regard as well as where I was actually sending the request to. I still had the temporal coupling. The response was different, but there was many different aspects there of coupling that got me. It was the technology because of the NuGet package. It was the, for, the structure of the data changed and the location of where I was sending that request changed. So the next time you hear about tight coupling or loose coupling, you should ask what exactly? Just because you've implemented a venture of an architecture and you remove that temporal aspect, like many things with trade-offs, you yes, you're removing that temporal aspect and that could be great in a particular context, but you're introducing another set of problems that you're gonna to need to address. Just because you have two different services that are communicating over HP that maybe could be in process, adding that network call, sure, while it removed that technology coupling, added another set of problems of introducing that network call. You're always gonna be battling coupling, but thinking about the different aspects in a given context and whether it fits that need for the problems that you're gonna introduce. If you enjoy topics like this and you wanna chat with other software developers, check out the link in the description on how to join my channel where you can have a conversation and talk with other software developers about architecture and design. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.